again because we believe that you are the way, the truth, and the life, and that only through your great name, the name of Jesus, can we enter into, the, into eternal salvation. Lord, we ask that you have your way in, our, in the hearts of everyone here today, and may they know you not only as a Savior, but also as the Lord of their lives. Thank you for this time together with you on this Good Friday morning. You are good and you are kind and you are always faithful. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Pastor White. Well, welcome, everyone. I'm Randy McCreich, your MC for today. And we're excited that you're here. Today is Good Friday. We celebrate Jesus Christ's death on the cross, the payment for our sin. And Good Friday is significant for two reasons. It wasn't just a good man that died that day. It was the Son of God. But on that day, which was a dark day because of his death, Sunday was coming. It was on that day that he was resurrected, raised from the dead, and was carried off to heaven. And so we know that we fall short of the glory of God because we're sinners. But because of that death on the cross, he was the payment for our sin. So as we seek him and ask him to come into our hearts, he becomes our Savior and Lord, and we get the forgiveness of sin and get the, the hope of eternal life. And that's what we celebrate today. And so it is a glorious day, Good Friday, that we come together. Uh, now it's time to enjoy Diane Singleton singing How Can It Be? Ashamed of what I've done, what I've become. These hands are dirty. I dare not lift them up to the Holy One. You plead my cause. You Break my chains, you overcome. You gave your life to give me mine. You say that I am free. How can it be? Afraid I've let you down Inside I doubt that you still love me But in your eyes there's only grace now You please my call Hey, you overcome. You 
you break my chains you overcome you gave your life to give me more you say that I am free you plead my cause you love my wrongs you break my Prayer team would come up, please. On page two, we have the schedule, and we're going to have a time of prayer. Introduce Ken Kolek. Let's pray. First, we as members of the business community need to repent on how we have chosen to do business with more emphasis on satisfying the request of man than to please and glorify God. Pray for us. Next we ask your conviction next we ask your conviction each business person to study and know your purpose for all and each businessman and woman then intentionally and knowingly seek out to act on your instructions with the singular desire to provide praise and glory to God. We've been provided abundant opportunity to influence many more lives through business and commerce. May we serve you with an attitude of bended knee, bowed head, and a broken heart for the lost. We seek and ask your hand of guided blessings to experience how to work inside your plan, your way. We ask these things in the precious and great name of Jesus. Amen. Continuing in prayer, Heavenly Father, we come to you as your servants. We come to you as uh, family members in the family of faith. And I pray that you'd bind us together as churches represented, uh, they're large and small that are old and new, those that are on the outskirts of this community and those that are toward the center of town. God, I pray that you'd bring us unity as we seek to provide a, a beacon, a, a shining light, a, a hope for this world that's so desperately lost. And I pray that our churches would, would remain pure and would remain uh, founded upon your word. And I pray that where, where conviction is needed, that you would bring that, where comfort is needed, that you would bring that. I pray that our churches would represent you well that you would be glorified, that you would be honored through the churches that are represented here in this room and in other churches in our community. And God, we ask your blessing upon us as we seek to carry out your will and as we, we have the hope of the promise that, that your church will not fail. Yeah. So guide us, God, as we seek to live out our lives in honor of the Son, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and God, we lift up all the educators tasked with so much more than just teaching nowadays. God, I pray you'd give them the ability not only to teach, to give kids a foundation uh, to be successful, God, and, um, but maybe to study your word someday, God, to open up your word and know exactly what it means and exactly what it tells them to do, Lord. That you may give them the wisdom or the under, understanding to know what your word tells them and the courage to live that out. Give the teachers and educators and coaches and directors the ability to do much more than just teach, but to counsel, to help to encourage, to come alongside, to put their arm around, and to simply be uh, the hands and feet of, of Christ. 
God, we pray that uh, no brick walls would ever keep you from the work that you want to do in our school buildings. God, we pray that you would take over that place by the power of your Holy Spirit and that you would work in there, that you would, you would stir in the hearts of our kids to ask those, those questions that would allow us to, to explain who you are and what you've done. God, we lift up those educators that revere your name, and I pray that you would draw kids to them, and I pray that they would ask questions to them, that, that you would provide answers to them, that those kids may come to know exactly who you are. I pray that you give them success and favor, that they would, they would just take your light and take it to the highest place, God, and let it shine bright for all to see. And I pray uh, mostly that these kids would come to know you, God, that you would provide a way that these kids would come to know you, that teachers would come to know you, so that your name may be made great, God, that you would receive all of the glory. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Praying a familiar verse, but not always practiced. This mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. I'm going to pray with my eyes open and look at you, and I invite you to listen to the Lord with your eyes closed. Father, I repent on behalf of husbands everywhere who have not loved their wives like you love and have loved and will love the church, sacrificially, with consideration, leading with direction and purpose and a sense of destiny. And with Patricia, and we repent on behalf of wives who have not respected their husbands in this nation and around the world in what is called your church. And Patricia and I are in agreement, Lord, to ask this morning for a release of original intent in every marriage, upon every man, upon every woman, original intent that they would be a visible, our marriages would be a visible expression of the great agape love and respect that you would have us show the world around us so the world might see your limitless love for each of us through our marriages. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you pray with me? We pray that your light washes over those serving our great people at all levels giving them the wisdom to do not only what is right, but what is just and good for the people of Iowa, for our country, and for the world. We pray your grace shows them that words do matter. Lord, give them the courage and the strength to stand up and speak out, even at times when it is not easy or popular to do so. And give them the strength to respond in the right way when those words coming at them may feel more like arrows and may be intentionally hurtful. Give them the strength to realize that the loudest voices are not always the most voices. We pray that their conscience is not troubled by the heavy decisions they oftentimes must bear. While at the same time, we pray they will follow your will in making those heavy and important decisions. We pray you will help give them guidance when they make a bad choice. Show them forgiveness is an option. We ask you, Lord, to continue to watch over our leaders as they work to do the most good for the most people. In your name, amen. Our Father, we come before you this morning on behalf of those who serve our country, our cities, and our homes. First of all, for the military who leave family and loved ones to put themselves in harm's way in defense of our country. For law enforcement who 24 hours a day serve to protect our cities, our streets, and our homes as we sleep safely in our beds. For firefighters who rush to fires large and small, risking their lives to serve others. And last but not least, emergency medical personnel who rush to the aid of those hurt by accidents or illness. We also want to be mindful to pray for those families of those who serve, comfort them in their concern for those they love. And most of all, we ask that those who perhaps do not know Christ as their Savior would do so soon. In the name of Jesus, once crucified, once buried, once raised, and coming soon. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen. This morning, Father God, create in us a clean heart and renew in us a right spirit. I hold up to you, Father, the 
people today involved in healing ministries, and I ask that uh, as we meet those who are suffering, that we meet them with the eyes of Christ, that we see clearly the nature of suffering, and I pray, Father, for our patients, that they would see the true healer. Father God, uh, as we um, think today about the nature of the suffering servant, help us to crucify ourselves with Christ and no longer to live, but to allow Christ to live in us. Help us to see the way that you do, and in all things to bring you glory, to act justly, to walk humbly, and to be merciful. In Jesus' name. God and Father, thank you for the greatest gift of all, your Son, Jesus Christ. As professionals in the media and entertainment space, Lord, we are desperately in need of the prayers of everyone in this room. Amen. As your people, our focus should be on you, your word, your will, but instead our focus is so worldly, we're concerned about what's happening on our phones, on our televisions, who's got the best Twitter feed, or how we can get the best selfie. Please help us to use this weekend to celebrate, to reconnect with your wisdom, your love, and especially your people. We are fallen people in the media and entertainment space. So often we celebrate things that are not just wrong, but are anti-good or evil. People look to those of us in the media and entertainment as trendsetters, as movement leaders. So, Lord, we ask for your help and strength to set a trend toward humility and love for our brothers and sisters. Lord, we ask for your help and strength to move to a place where our leadership draws people towards you instead of pushing them away from you. Ultimately, though, we have temporal needs here. Ultimately, it's not about real news. It's not about fake news. It's about the good news of your son, Jesus Christ, who sacrificed his life so that we could have eternal life in his loving embrace. Lord God, you are the only one, the only one who can take the death of anyone and make something good out of it. You are all powerful. You are worthy of our praise, as is your son, Jesus Christ, the risen one. Amen. Thank you all prayers. We appreciate that very much. <clears throat> it is the Good Friday prayer breakfast, so it's our opportunity to go to the one who does answer prayer. So we want to honor that. So if you look in your program in the middle, as all of those who support this program, so if you would look through that list, <clears throat> and please if you would support those uh, people who invest in this program, we'd appreciate that, and they would too. So I'll give you a couple minutes to go through that. So now it's time to hear about this year's ministry, Mission of Hope. So Director Kim Reen. Good morning, everyone. I always like to start by asking you to stand. If you have ever prayed for Mission of Hope, if you have ever donated to Mission of Hope, either your finances, uh, your time, or your treasures, uh, this time, please stand. Thank you, and let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. We are so grateful for your support from the bottom of our hearts, but please know that uh, as I stand before you that this is not my work or the work of any of you who are standing, but this is the Lord's work, and he has used each and every one of us as a funnel, as a conduit into Mission of Hope so that we may bless this community that we are uh, uh, able to serve. At this time, I would also like to ask our board members and our staff if they would just stand for a moment and be recognized. And we have some here. Bart Woods. I always appreciate the invitation to attend an event like this, and Bob, you're so great to say, come and share everything 
wonderful that's going on with Mission to Hope and you get five minutes. It's like, wow, that's not, you know, elevator speech times two maybe, but anyway, I'm grateful to be here today. I can tell you that it's a privilege to serve at Mission to Hope where we're focused on emergency relief, restoration, and development of those who come through our doors. But the very most important thing that we do on purpose is share Jesus Christ and his love with those we serve. And we're proud of that. Because of that, uh, we don't take any state or federal funding. We're, we're funded completely through uh, private donations, folks like yourself, organizations, churches, and so forth, that partner with us to provide support. So as you consider today whether you may be able to support Mission of Hope financially, I hope that you will take that seriously and that if God would lay that on your heart, that you could bless us in that way. I tell you truly that my faith has been so increased as the executive director of Mission of Hope because before I came there, I had a background in faith, grew up in a Christian home that did not make me a Christian, but I made that choice on my own. And I got to go to Christian school and to Bible college and have had a lot of fantastic opportunities. And if you would have said, Kim, are you a person of faith? I would have said, oh yeah, yes, yes I am. But I can tell you that today I stand before you as a person of faith in a different way. Because every day that I'm blessed to be a part of Mission of Hope, I get to see God do what I can't do on my own what the staff who work there can't do, what the board can't do, and it's because it's God's work, not our work. One morning, we needed $10,000, and it wasn't just, like, it would be really great if we could get this. It was a need, a dire need. Said to the staff that morning, we got to have this $10,000, and we do not have it. But you know what? Today, we're going to lift this need up to God. We're going to trust him to meet the need. And we're going to wait and we're going to see how he handles this. But we're going to we're going to be expecting. That was like at 9:15 in the morning. 11:30, two guys came through the front door. They had on suits and ties and trench coats, not our usual clients. And so the staff came running to see me and they're like, there's these two guys out there and they got suits and ties and and trench coats and they're asking for you. Oh, it's the feds. They've come, they're looking for somebody. And so I come out of the kitchen. Now it's one of those days when I was helping make lunch and I had my hairnet and my gloves and my apron. Gals, you know how it is when company comes, you don't wear those things to greet them at the door, right? And I just, you know, came out of the kitchen and I'm like, how can I help you guys? And they said, oh no, we're here to help you. Wow, okay, I'm listening, keep talking. They brought a check from a foundation that morning, two and a half hours after we prayed. Want to guess how much the check was for? $10,000. And I had to sit down, yes, give the Lord a hand on that. I had to sit down really hard for a minute, and I said to the two men, well, God delivers faster than FedEx, you know? It's like, I don't know, if any of you have any needs out here, see me after the service. Now it's our opportunity to support the mission of hope. So our forms and envelopes on your table in a basket. If you'd pass those around, please. I'll give you a couple minutes to consider uh, your contribution. Thank you. So there's a new share of the gospel movement sweeping the nation called Saturate USA. Here to explain Saturate Iowa is Brother Charles Daughtery from Serve the City. Hello, Serve the City. There is a brochure on your table you can look at later. I'm going to get to Saturate, but I have to tell you about Charles and my new agnostic friend. 
I went to a high school basketball game, one of my relatives senior playing basketball. And we went down and I noticed this man standing at the gym door and as the teenagers, high school students came in and out, they're loving on him and he's loving on them. And my niece says, well, that's the principal. And so we're in this prayer care share mode. By the way, all of you in here have been prayed for for four years, at least one time out loud by name. God's blessing you. So I'm praying for the principal. Lord, you want me to talk to him? I felt a nudge. Yes, I get out of my seat, go around, buy a soda at the concession stand so he knows I'm supporting the school, and I engage in conversation. Thank you for being an educator. Thank you for being a principal. Thank you for helping our next generation. And we talk some, and I say, I notice you're a really happy guy. Where is the source of your happiness? I said, do you have a church home somewhere? He said, Charles, no. You guys can have that if you wish, but I have my own source of joy, and I don't need that. He says, the problem with you pastors, Charles, and your church is, you know, we're farm country, right? You all know what a silo is? Those rough. He says, the problem with you pastors in your church is that you live in silos, and you don't do anything together, and I hear you criticizing each other, and uh, so why should I believe in there's a God? And I said, much to his amazement, his eyes got big, I said, I couldn't agree with you more. He looks at me, and I said, you know, you just paraphrased a verse in the Bible. If God's people act like God's people and love each other, then those that don't know God yet will believe there is one. But if we, the converse is true. So you're absolutely right on with the Bible. But where I come from, Back over by Cedar Rapids, we have a group of pastors and congregations and ministry and ministry leaders that believe that there is one church and we get along, we like each other and we care for each other. In fact, we do a lot of things together and I goes on and, and I said, your name is, sounds German. I said, do you know about the Amana Church? He said, yes. I said, one of my dreams, prayers before I leave this earth is that I get to preach on Sunday at the Amana Church. He said, you know, Charles, I know a couple of the elders there. You tell me the date you want to go, and I'll put a good word in for you. In fact, I'll even come listen to you. If we're winsome and real and loving, the world will listen. And so uh, Saturate is a deal where we've done lots of things together here, over 200 events since 1998 together. But in Saturate, did anybody get one of these on their door? Raise your hand if you did. It's coming. Did you say you got two? <laughs> anyway, there's a letter in here that says that uh, we are concerned about the discord and chaos that have become magnified in our society in recent years. We are offering this gift as the most relevant solution. The first names of over 40 pastors and executive directors are on the bottom, and on the back is a list by zip code of where they are. Inside is a Jesus video. Now, I know it's old, but five billion people have watched this, and it is true to the book of Luke, and the word of God will not return void. Eight languages. QR code on the back. Take their smartphone. Actually open up to 1,600 languages. Watch the movies. There's three of them on this from their phone or their tablet. You get to watch children disagree about whether Jesus is the Messiah and kind of get into it. <laughs> And, uh, but at the end, a child leads another child to the Lord. You see Mary Magdalena talk about how Jesus delivered her from the demons. And she talks about the woman at the well, the woman with the issue of blood, the woman caught in adultery. She narrates, and at the end, Dino woman leads another woman to the Lord. There is a track in here that says, would you like to know God personally? Super track. There's a card. We're in the digital world. Face uh, anonymous talking back and forth. What are you facing today? You don't have to face it alone. A website, iowa.issuesiface.com. And if someone goes there and clicks and wants to talk to somebody, they're going to get a mentor from Iowa. I'll be over here at this table at the end. I'd love to talk to you about it. We want to take this. We now have 135 homes, 1,000 homes, and we want to take this to Iowa. Well, this is a treat. Back in the 80s, you know, Vince Ferragamo got hurt, and as a Rams fan, that was okay by me, because um, I had this friend, Jeff, and he and Stacy and Debbie and I were in the same fellowship group, and he was with the Rams, and 
It's like, I want to see him play. He had a good year that year. Um, we were young. You know, maybe we were young and stupid, but we were young and we were, we were Christians. We were looking ahead. I mean, I was in my 20s. What's God going to do with all the years ahead? So you think there's a whole lot of good stuff going on. Well, last night we got to see each other again. It's been a couple decades since Jeff and I have seen each other. Um, but we caught up and something interesting happened back in those 80s, young and stupid. Jeff took his yes and he put it on the table for the Lord. I'm not sure he knew what that meant. I'm not sure what I knew that, what that meant when Debbie and I did that. But last night we caught up of what's the Lord done in the last 35 years. And it wasn't what I thought. I don't know if it was what Jeff thought, um, but God's at work. God does amazing things. And so I'd just like you to welcome my friend Jeff Kemp. Um, it's been wonderful seeing what the Lord's done, but I think you're in for a treat. So give a big Iowa welcome for Jeff. Thank you, Brett. Great to connect again with you and Debbie. That's going back a long time to Southern California. And uh, I actually remember my very first summer in Southern California. Um, by way of background, today I'm married to Stacy. We have four sons. We've been married 36 years. All our sons are married. They're starting to have kids. We have two grandkids and one on the way. Uh, none of that was envisioned way back in 1981 when I came out of Dartmouth College as a free agent, uh, 50 to 1 odds against making it in the NFL. And I came to training camp that year, and there were 50 of us rookies trying for about 12 or 13 spots on the team, no veterans for the first week of training camp. And uh, so this second day of practice, this little boy, eight years old, came up to me and he said, can I carry your helmet for you to the locker room? So this is after practice. I said, sure, and gave it to him. He carried it half a mile to the locker room at Cal State Fullerton. Uh, and then the next morning, he'd ridden his bicycle to the, to the locker room and was waiting for me. And he carried my helmet and my shoulder pads out to practice, watched two and a half hours of practice, carried it back, came back after lunch, did the same thing for that practice. He did it for three days in a row. And as far as I could tell, no other rookies had a personal equipment caddy like I did. <laughs> I was kind of a big deal. And uh, so walking off after this third day of his uh, caddying my stuff for me. We were on a first name basis, this little guy and I, and uh, he looked up at me and he said to me in total seriousness, Jeff, can I ask a question? And I said, sure. Now, I thought it would be an autograph or maybe a tip on throwing the ball. I've been practicing autographs since I was eight years old. Big J, Fancy K, Finish with Flourish. I'd never given one, but uh, I'm ready. So I say, yeah, whatever you want to ask. And he looks up at me, he goes, Jeff, when do the good guys come to training camp? <laughs> Bust my bubble. I love that story for a couple of reasons. Yeah, it's funny, but he was carrying out the single greatest characteristic of any human being. He was being a servant. Jesus, who we focus upon on Good Friday and all through this weekend, Easter, and then if we figured out who he is, really figured out who he is, we celebrate him every single day and moment of our life. That's something that I have not done all that well in my life. But it's my goal every single day to celebrate him all the time. Jesus didn't come to be served, but to serve. And this little boy's serving me, so he's a pretty good role model. And secondly, though he packaged it in a bit more humiliation than I wanted, he gave me a great reminder of the single greatest character trait and attitude and mindset that any human could ever have. And it's ironic that we, imperfect, selfish, proud, dumb people, I guess I'm talking about myself, you guys are, are smart, are proud and arrogant. But Jesus, the perfect one, is humble. And this little kid reminded me to be humble. If you think about history, everything bad has begun with pride. Have you ever won an argument in marriage? No, because you just beat the person that you're one with, so pride is what leads to that. 
And then the division of races, the division between denominations, the arguments, the lawsuits. Pride is at the root of the trouble. Go all the way back to Lucifer's rebellion from God. It was pride. And Adam and Eve thought, hey, maybe we can do this our own a little bit better. They got tricked and deceived and, and went the wrong way. So pride has always got us in trouble. But what is the beginning of everything good? It's this stance. Man, I can't do it on my own. I need some help. I am not perfect. In fact, I'm flawed. And I'm not afraid to say that I'm flawed. And other people have a lot of wisdom, and I need God. Humility. Humility opens the door to healing. Humility is what puts a marriage back together. Humility is what makes you listen to a leader rather than a leader who just bosses you at you. So thank you to that little eight-year-old boy for a couple good lessons. This is a prayer breakfast, and I'm happy because I've gone to lots of prayer breakfasts before where we talked all about prayer, but we never stopped and prayed. So let me make sure I do the right thing. Let's pray. Father God, uh, I need you and I want to represent you, and I ask for your Holy Spirit to control me and dominate me and make sure that what I say agrees with the Word of God that is true and that it points to Jesus, who is also called the Word of God and is the perfect manifestation of love and truth, 100% of each. So and I also pray that every single person here who came here would realize that they're here for a purpose, that you aren't a God of accidents, and that you want us all to know you better and be changed, maybe to discover you for the first time, or to realize how little of our life we've given to you and how much better it would be to let you run our life instead of ourselves. So, God, have your way this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we're going to explore a little bit the idea of prayer. Um, if it's prayer, it's got to be relational, because God is a relational God, and you're talking to someone. Interesting, though, uh, Mother Teresa was interviewed on a television show one time, and the interviewer said, when you pray, Mother Teresa, which you do so much, what do you say to God? And she said, hmm, I don't really say anything, I just listen. And then the interviewer said, well, what does God say to you? And she thought, and she said, he doesn't really say anything, he just listens. <laughs> and the guy's face was befuddled, and then he, he looked, she looked at him, and she said, and and if you can't really understand that right now, I'm sorry, because I can't explain it. <laughs> There's something about spirits connecting, which is the basis of the relationship. Our prayers are meant to be way more than God. Here's my list. Could you please take care of these things? That's what we do with Santa Claus. But this is our Father who wants to know us and has given us his Son. And there's something about our hearts connecting. Now, I, I want to talk about relationship with God. I want to talk about prayer, listening to him, or being open to him. And he's fine with us giving him our requests, but he'd also like some relationship time, not just a checklist. But I also want to talk about blitzes, trials, tribulations, difficulties, hardships, yucky, rotten stuff that you do not want to have happen, like a, what, 12, 15-foot flood that comes through and ruins all the first floors of many businesses and takes away the livelihoods of many folks, certainly also takes life. We've, I was in Nebraska not too long ago where all the new calves uh, seemingly in certain parts of Nebraska were killed uh, and farmers lost the ability to plant crops this year. Uh, we, we have tragedies all over the world. We've had shootings in schools multiple times. We had 9-11. No lives were lost, but a, a great cathedral burned in Paris the other day and people were distraught over that. Blitzes and bad things happen, right? You know blitzes, that's a football word, right? When they send a whole bunch of people at the offense and you don't have enough people to protect and it's very dangerous. Okay, we'll talk about some of those things. In 1991, my last season, because I did make that team, I, I, I kind of had some help from God on a 50 to one odds. Uh, and I had this young lady at University of Southern California that read an article about me and, and saw that I had a faith in God. They said, are you worried about getting cut from the team you know, you're the fifth quarterback, they only keep three. And I said, no, I'm leaving in, in God's hands. That was kind of a bold Christian statement back in those days, because Tim Tebow hadn't gone out there and really set the pace yet. Uh, and so this co-ed at, at uh, USC um, saw that article and thought she'd write me a letter and started writing me a letter to encourage me that I put my faith in God and I have a good influence on kids. Um, and she started praying for me twice a day at the time of practices. 
and all these quarterbacks started getting hurt. They're... <laughs> one, one guy broke his thumb, another one had tendonitis, and all of a sudden I'm the only guy that's healthy and throwing the ball, and they had to keep me. Um, anyway, I married that young lady, Stacy, uh, after my second season. Uh, she didn't even know me when she was praying for me, and, and God brought us together, uh, which is really important because we have the most opposite personalities of two people in the world, and the marriage counselors that we've seen and the pastor that married us all stated that. The only thing we have in similarity is that we're both dominant leaders. She's a 99 dominant leader, and I'm a 97, which bugs me because I'm competitive and she beat me. <laughs> Does anyone hear of one of those marriages that has a lot of friction? Let's, let's be honest, okay? Friction creates heat. And if you use your pride to say they should be like me and they should apologize to me and I don't need to apologize to them, then you're going downhill in the direction of isolation and loneliness, even in a marriage. But if you use that friction and that heat as a conflict to develop intimacy by seeking to understand that person and realizing that God puts opposites together to make good teams, then you can overcome the friction and the frustration and you can bond with the Holy Spirit as your glue for life. That's Jeff and Stacy's story and that's how we got into helping other marriages because it was so stinking hard for us that we had to get a ton of help. And when we got a ton of help, our cup started to overflow and we started helping other couples on the teams that we were on and then our neighborhood. And then our pastor said, hey, would you lead the young marriage? We said, us? Why us? He goes, because if you can stay married, anyone can. <laughs> that was our endorsement. So we're in the season 1991, my 11th year of football. Stacey and I have been married at that point for nine and a half years. And uh, she started praying that season, and I wouldn't have affirmed or given him permission for this prayer had I known about it, that God would do something in our life to stir up our kids' faith. They were just little six, four, and one. And, you know, believing in Jesus, Sunday school stuff, thanks for the meal, thanks for all these Christmas gifts, we have hot running water, we live in America. We have no idea how fortunate we are. Well, we had an interesting year uh, with a lot of things to pray about. And uh, we were playing a, a game on Sunday night against the Raiders. And uh, we was going pretty well until overtime when I threw a pass to a friend of mine who caught it. His problem was, it was, his name was Ronnie Lott. He was the safety on the other team, the Raiders that <laughs> night. And uh, in overtime, they just kicked a field goal on the very next play and beat us. And two days later, the coach called me in and said, uh, we're gonna have to let you go. Mid-season starter, we won three and lost three under my tenure as the Seahawk quarterback, and I'm cut out of the league. NFL, you know what it stands for? Not for long. <laughs> every, week, every week, you gotta get your job back. So I'm blitzed. I lose my job. I go home. Stacy puts the special plate at my spot at the table. Red plate that says, you're special. We love you. We do it for birthdays, getting an A on a test, losing your job, things like that. <laughs> and uh, she starts talking to me and the boys about why she loves me and why I'm special. Boys, I love your daddy because he loves God. I love your daddy because he's humble and he likes to grow. He's always trying to learn. He's faithful to us. He's a good daddy. I'm crying. She's crying. I'm in the middle of a blitz, I'm getting fired, I'm just losing my career, and yet I'm feeling love at the table like never before, and my boys are seeing love, as we're supposed to. A pastor was talk, praying for our marriages. We are stinking proud in our marriages. We take our spouse for granted. We look at other people's Instagram and their nice Lexus, and their body is still skinny, and we compare ourselves to them, which we're comparing our exterior to their interior, it's not a fair comparison. And then we stop appreciating and being grateful for and investing in our spouse, and we wonder why the asset value drops. You're, you're an investment dude, right, Don? Consumers lose the asset value. But investors think about the long term, and they're willing to defer a little bit right now by saying, I'm sorry, by forgiving, by choosing a date instead of playing golf, by honoring and appreciating and praising and saying thank you to your spouse. Man, we need to invest in our marriages. And this morning might be just a wake-up call for some of us. I need to wake up multiple times each month because I quickly fall into that consumer mode. But that night, my wife was investing in me, and it was awesome. 
And the prayer at, di at dinner that night was said by six-year-old Kyle. He's now a bond trader in New York City uh, with a little boy named Jack French Kemp. If you remember my dad who used to come to Cedar Rapids to campaign, uh, the Dole Kemp campaign and all that stuff. Uh, my son named his son Jack French Kemp after my dad, which is pretty cool. But Kyle was six, and he said the prayer. Dear God, thanks for the food, and thanks for Daddy. Please give him a new team. I want him to be on the Eagles. Amen. <laughs> he doesn't even watch or know about NFL football. Stacy and I look at each other with this quizzical look on our face. We figured it out. Our family Bible verses, Isaiah 40, 31, to mount up with wings as eagles, okay? Your strength is renewed in God. And he had named his soccer team, the little league soccer team he was on, the Eagles, because he's a leader. Because my dad used to tell us, you're a camp, be a leader, you're a camp, be a leader. We passed a little bit of that on to our kids. So he was the one who uh, named the, the soccer team, the Eagles, and he wanted daddy to have the same emblem and name as his team. Check it out, next morning, Harry Gamble, GM of the Philadelphia Eagles, calls me up and says, Jeff, Randall Cunningham broke his leg this year, and Jim McMahon, he's been playing pretty well, but he sprained his ponytail. <laughs> How soon can you get out here? And I'm on a flight the next morning. Next morning. Is this, do you remember the prayer my wife had prayed? That God would do something to stir up our faith, to show us that he's real, to bring us into closer relationship with him vertically? All right? He's doing things, but it's coming through some circumstances that we wouldn't have wanted. I didn't want to throw an interception. I didn't want to get cut. Stacy didn't want to have to move the family to Philadelphia, but she packed up and did it in nine days because I was totally unavailable because I was learning a brand new system so I could work in the Eagle language instead of the Seahawk language in a week and a half. Four weeks, actually the first week I was there, I had a concussion. They carried me off the field after being out for three, three full minutes. Uh, state, the boys are crying while they see that that's their daddy on the field, and she's praying, thinking, God, why did you paralyze my husband and break his neck in Philadelphia, apart from my whole support system? But she prayed and said, guys, remember all the things God's done to take care of us? Who's in charge now? And they said, God. Pretty soon they were in the police car with a chance to go to the hospital following the ambulance, and uh, they said, can you turn on the lights and the siren? And they forgot all about me. They had the best time of their life that day. So it really turned out well. <laughs> um, and four weeks after that, we're playing in Houston. The stadium's called the House of Pain. The defense is the number two defense in the league. It's Monday Night Football. The Eagles have the number one defense. Oilers have the number two off, uh, defense. Excuse me. We both have great defenses. And Warren Moon is getting knocked around by our defense. Jim McMahon's getting knocked around by their defense. And he gets knocked out of the game late in the third quarter. It's six to three. We're losing. We can't get anything done because their defense is so aggressive. And we're on the 20-yard line for the first time. That's red zone, chance to score. And the coaches get a little greedy, and they called a very slow-developing, deep corner route to the tight end where the quarterback has to drop back nine yards. I'm at the line of scrimmage, Monday Night Football. First time I've ever had this opportunity with the Seahawks, or the, excuse me, the Eagles, uh, since that concussion. 425. This play's never going to work. 425. I don't have time for a three-step drop back, much less a seven-step drop back. Now, that is not the Tony Robbins power of positive thinking that you want to have on Monday Night Football in the NFL. But in the next second, I noticed that linebackers were beady-eyed and coming at me, and the free safety from 15 yards deep at the five-yard line was sneaking like a snake in the grass. Through those linebackers coming full bore at me, hey, I got a Dartmouth education. I can figure this out. This is a blitz. It's an all-out attack. In the next couple seconds, either something very bad or what? Very good is about to happen because blitzes are not just danger, they are also opportunity. But we football players have been trained to expect blitzes, not go through life hoping nothing bad ever happens. And we all know what to do. Now, sometimes you can't respond quickly and, and handle the blitz, and that's why defenses do it. But in this case, running backs dove in front of linebackers and sacrificed themselves. Think of Jesus, sacrifice. Keith Jackson changed his route from a corner to a post, the tight end. I changed from a seven-step drop to a quick five. Hit my fifth foot, couldn't step up because there was no room. There was a free safety in my face, kind of an eclipse as I looked for Keith. But I threw it to the spot at which I expected him to be. 
part of the way I did that is because I had vision of where he would be. Helen Keller was at a college campus once, and a student raised her hand and said, Miss Keller, I can't imagine anything worse than being blind. And Helen Keller said, oh, yes, it'd be so much worse to have your eyesight but lack vision. Why are we at a Good Friday prayer breakfast? So we can regain vision of the biggest story in history, that humanity giving, given full free will to choose God or reject God because it would only be love if it was free. And God isn't a God who twists our arm and says, believe in me. Churches do that sometimes. Some evangelists do that sometimes. Some parents do that with their kids and then their kids rebel. God doesn't twist our arm. He puts it out in there. And humanity rebelled. We all messed it up. We have all these divisions and problems today. But God solved the problem, sends Jesus from heaven and perfection into Mary's womb, a manger, a carpenter. And then his life goes very awry according to the game plan, which was supposed to be the conquering king. He ends up getting crucified. But it doesn't stay that way, does it? He's resurrected on Easter. 500 people see him. He's around for 40 days. He says, it's better that I go away and send the Holy Spirit to be with every person who believes in me at the same time around the globe than for me to stay here just physically with a few of you. And so today we live in an era where Jesus is the most influential person in the, all of history, but he's not just a person, he's also God, and his presence is the Holy Spirit. And I just ask his Holy Spirit to talk to me, and then whatever you're hearing right now is the Holy Spirit talking to you. Vision. It's the art of seeing what's invisible to others. We need to take this vision that we're talking about this morning and make it our every morning wake-up call, our reminder during the middle of the day. The minute a blitz hits, we need to think, oh, wait a minute, God is big, and he turns blitzes into good things. He overcomes the trouble. He forgives the sin. He responds to our humility. He modeled humility in Christ. So, everyone on the team changes what they do. I throw the ball right by the ear hole of the free safety. He hits me in the face, I fall down, he's on top of me, I wipe his spit off of my face, roll him off of me, and we wait to see, is it really noisy, good for Houston, or really quiet, good for Philadelphia? And sure enough, Keith Jackson and everyone on our team adapted and changed, didn't do the same thing we were going to do, because the blitz is dangerous unless you change. And we chose to change, and Keith caught the ball in the end zone, scored the only touchdown of the game. We won 13 to six, and the blitz went from bad to good in a couple of seconds, from trouble to triumph very fast. That's a metaphor for life. I'm really not here to talk about football this morning. The challenge is your cancer diagnosis, your son's addiction, the breakup of your marriage, the bankruptcy you went through, the flooding of this community, the other blitzes that we face in life, they don't turn around quite so quickly, do they? But I do want you to know that they do turn around if you follow God's blueprints for how to face a blitz. And there is an example for how to face a blitz. It is Jesus Christ. How did God save the world? By coming and giving a speech? Holding a church service? doing a magic trick, being a king. That's what they expected, a king that would overthrow Rome. Instead, he intentionally went to the cross, bore the sin of the world, experienced separation from his father, took the punishment for all of humanity's sin, and I got a bunch of it myself, but multiply that by all of us, was buried, and then he rose from the dead to show that he was truly God and had the power to have paid for our sin. And so God took a blitz for us, and it turned into the greatest victory ever. Now, Jesus talked about blitzes. You don't know that he was big into football, but he was. You know, he invented everything, so he already knew things. He said that in this world, you're going to get blitzed. But don't panic. I've overcome the blitz. You guys look confused. Don't you have the NFL version of the Bible? <laughs> John 16, 33, you can look it up. Apostle Paul, he also talked about blitzes. Romans chapter 5 records where he says that we don't just rejoice in the fact that we have grace from God and peace with God 
and forgiveness and eternal life. And we're going to see the, the glory of God forever and ever if we have a relationship with him because in humility we accepted him. Not by our merit, not by religious stuff, not by not doing bad stuff, not by doing good stuff. Those are all outflows of loving him. There are no way to earn anything with him. You can't do anything bad enough to make God not love you. And you cannot do anything good enough to make him love you more. If you could, we Christians would go, I'm a pretty good Christian. Which is exactly the opposite of what leads us to Christ. Humility. Giving up. Saying, I don't have it. I can't do it. I can't fix it. I can't climb this gap to perfection in heaven. Humility. Paul says, we don't just rejoice in these wonderful things, this hope of glory with God forever and the peace that we have with God. We also rejoice in our blitzes because blitzes bring about perseverance in a relationship with Jesus. And perseverance in our faith brings about character like Jesus. And character brings about hope. Not just this week or this month in my IRA or my investments in this season, my team winning the championship. Hope in eternity. Peace, love, perfection with God forever. And hope never disappoints. And it doesn't say all this, but it basically it means that when you stop looking to your circumstances for your satisfaction and joy, and you look to what God has done, then you feel more love than ever, ever before. And love is poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 5, verses 3, 4, and 5. The NFL version uses blitzes. The NIV and English Standard Version say, we rejoice in our trials, our tribulations, and our suffering. That doesn't sound very American, does it? Well, guess what? Jesus wasn't an American. He was a Jew. And he's welcoming Muslims and Hindus and agnostics and atheists and Christians who fake that they're a Christian with a little Christian fish and they show up all the time with all the Christian things, but they are still proud, they have not submitted, and they're trying to earn their way to heaven. And of course, a real Christian isn't someone who has a label or just goes into church, just like going into a garage doesn't make you a car. Is Jesus in you? And, and have you given him the chance to be in you? And have you said, I want to stop running my life and I want you to run my life? And this is a message for those of us who've never given our life to Jesus before and invited him in, but it isn't a message for them only because guess what? A bunch of us, like me, have called ourselves Christians for quite a while, for me, since age 21, but I've given them about 18% of my life. God, I got this piece and this piece. You take care of all this other stuff. And if you ask yourself the question, what percentage, zero to 100, have I actually said to God, you own this? Have you gotten to the point where you actually realize that God is smarter than you, more benevolent than you, and he actually has a better game plan for your life than you do, even though it might have some twists and turns and blitzes in it? I think that's my journey. I'm trying to figure out how can I give him more percentage of my life every single day. And maybe I'm at 50% right now. I don't know. But the more you give it to him, the more you experience his peace. And then he uses you to bless and encourage and, and give hope to others. Not because you're perfect or you brag or you say, I, I got my act together. How many people want to listen to a guy who says, my marriage is perfect, we do everything right, we always say wonderful things to each other, we have romance all the time, men, you should be jealous. No one wants to listen to that person. That's unapproachable, that's unrealistic. That just makes me feel rotten by comparison. <laughs> I think that some of the best ministry, some of the best encouragement, some of the best help is leading with your errors, leading with your mistakes, leading with your struggles. Let your mess become your message and God be the goodness. We are the brokenness. But we're getting healed over time. My marriage is so much better than it used to be. But we have these weird arguments on the way to marriage conferences when we're the speakers. <laughs> and right after the marriage conference when we taught all these cool things, I back up onto the grass. She gets upset that I'm messing up with the grass. She says something to me. I don't like her tone. I say something stupid to her. We don't even talk for the whole way to the place where we're going. <laughs> so we're not quite there yet. But you just liked that story, didn't you? More than if I told you how perfect we were, which you'd be wondering, is he really? And if he is, I feel rotten by comparison. Or you're just thinking, there's no way he is, so I'm not going to listen to anything else he says. So be real. Share your blitzes. Share your weaknesses. Approach people with transparency and vulnerability. This is one of the keys to great teamwork in business. Pat Lencioni talks about 
trusting relationships, transparency and vulnerability, that leads to healthy conflict and debate so that people can feel included in the company's teamwork and then they'll make a commitment. When they make a commitment, they're gonna be willing to be accountable to one another, peer-to-peer -peer accountability. Finally, that'll get up to focused on results. Relationships based on vulnerability and trust are key to everything. But I don't have a very easy time being vulnerable and transparent if I don't know that my self-esteem, that my identity, my self-worth is more than the sum total of my behaviors and my resume. My identity, your identity, is based in who made us, God. What did he say? I made them male and female in my image. God is good and perfect and he makes wonderful things. We just happen to be messed up with some bad software and a little bit of a messed up heart right now. But we're worth an infinite amount. Your father loves you like crazy and let his son die for you. That's your identity. And when you accept Jesus Christ as your savior, the book of Corinthians, Paul expressed that anyone who believes in Jesus Christ and trusts him for his salvation, his eternal life, and trusts him to forgive that junk in your life that you feel bad about, and so you hide in shame and you keep drinking too much alcohol or you're playing with porn because it's quicker and easier than actually having a true relationship that leads to sexual intimacy with your spouse or you're cheating in the financial world because you've got to compare yourself to others. No, your true identity is based in knowing that God gave us the righteousness of Christ even before we're behaving righteously. And anyone who believes in Jesus Christ has all their sins wiped out. You have not changed completely yet. You're in the process of change. But the way God looks at you is he sees who you're gonna be in heaven. And he says, man, I love you so much. You're perfect. You're amazing. So everyone here, keep your looks, your beautiful good looks, Keep your sense of humor, keep your personality, but accept the identity of being God's chosen son or daughter, beloved by him. And in Christ, you have total righteousness, which means you have the same personality and credit of Jesus. That's how he looks at us. A lot of us still think God's mad at us. In Jesus, he doesn't need to be. He's loved us. So, some of you boys I talk about blitzes have been wondering about your blitzes. You've had them, haven't you? In the job area, the family area, the health area, maybe an addiction. I just want to st stop for a second right now. Let's just pray about our blitzes, our problems. Some of them we haven't healed from in the past. Some of them we're in right now. And ask God to show us how to turn them into something beautiful and good. Father, we're just looking inside our lives right now and realizing that we've gone through some blitzes that we didn't embrace as opportunities. Uh, we haven't yet really learned from some of them. Others, they were good for us as we look back. We thank you for the pain we went through and there was some gain in it. But I just pray for people that are in cancer, uh, who lost their job, whose marriage is in trouble or broke up, who have a son or daughter astray or perhaps a, a son or daughter that uh, is, is gone, that they lost. Um, the ache, the pain, doesn't go away there, but would you bring a certain new form of healing and hope and purpose and guide us through our blitzes, our trials and tribulations? May they turn into something that actually lets us help and serve and love other people that are going through tough stuff. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So, Jesus took what looked like the ultimate blitz supposed to be the conquering king, but instead he's in the garden praying, Father, I'd rather not drink this cup, but if this is the only way to save humanity, I will drink this cup because I want your will, not mine. And then he is stressing to the maximum degree again over this agony of having to go through with this, and he's sweating, this is, this is physiologically possible, drops of blood. And then he prays a second time that God would take this cup and says, but not my will, your will be done. And then he prays a third time, not my will, but your will be done. And all of the guys that he asked to pray with him, his disciples, they fell asleep. I've been asleep more than I should be in this world. Asleep to my wife's heart that's hurting. Asleep to the situation my son needs. Asleep to the concerns of the poor. Asleep to the necessity of being an ambassador for reconciliation who brings a person from a different background, different religion, different ethnic 
situation, different socioeconomic, different political perspective, brings them to your dinner table and starts to become human and friendly and breaks up this ridiculous, stupid labeling and hatred that our country is living in, where we just throw labels out at people and we say what's wrong with them. God is love. We're his ambassadors. You know I believe in politics. Debate the issues. Fight them strong on the issues. But love people. Every one of us need to love people, and you can't do that in pride. My party's better. BS. Parties are constructs. Ideas are good, and we need good ideas. We need to be humble, reconciling, use the dinner table, use hospitality, hang out with folks that we don't normally hang out with. That'll start to heal America, one neighborhood at a time. And do, please stay involved in politics. There's no Caesar in America, right? It's us, democracy, a republic. But I'm not here to talk about that. I'm here to talk about Jesus who took the blitz that turned into our success. And, and I'll give you one of my blitzes. Um, after that season with the Eagles where we played well and I won a bunch of games for them, they signed me to a big contract. I was excited. And at training camp in 92, I thought I'd revive my career, but I was the last player cut and they sent me home to Seattle. And for weeks I was praying the second best prayer. You know what the second best prayer is? God fix my circumstances. What's the best prayer? God fix what? Me, change me. Transform me so I can handle whatever comes my way and give you glory in the midst of it. Anyway, I'm praying the second best prayer. God, give me a team. Someone, please sign me, I wanna play. And finally, after four weeks, the Seahawks had a quarterback get hurt. I called the coach, I'm in town, I'm in shape, I'm ready, figured this is the answer to my prayer. He left a message for me, hey, sorry about the Eagles, we're gonna sign a guy from the World League, good luck to you, click. I guess my identity wasn't as completely wrapped up in God the Father and Jesus' love for me as I realized a little bit of it was, oh, I'm a quarterback who's a Christian. And uh, so it felt bad to be losing my career. 32 years old. I've since lost dad from cancer. I ran a nonprofit, um, and we ran out of money in 2010, and we had to let a number of people go. I fired myself. I fired the, my COO. Uh, we downsized, gave it to a 32-year-old guy who's rebuilt it. It's four times better. It serves military marriages in the Northwest and 40 states. It's doing great, but it took a blitz to get me there. So I've had a few worse blitzes since the, then, but losing my career hurt like crazy. And when that message came over to me, I slammed the door to my front door, my house. I went out to the porch. I sat down and I said, this stinks. This isn't fair. God, I'm not going to pray. I'm just going to sit here and feel this stinking pain. None of you would ever have a pity party for yourself, would you? Um, and I did. I had this pity party and I sat there stewing in my unfair suffering tribulation blitz. And then my wife came out and Stacy said, oh, Jeff, I can't imagine how much this hurts. I just want to remind you, though, that God's good. He's always been there when we went through tough stuff. He's always had a purpose and a plan. And I looked at her in my marital maturity, and I said, I know that. <laughs> I just want to finish football with some, some dignity. And then she realized this husband of hers needed a little tough love, not just the soft stuff. So my teammate, my greatest teammate, says to me in gentle words, as I recall, when Jesus left this world, he didn't receive any dignity. Maybe you need to let go of that desire. And I looked at her and said, maybe you need to go inside. <laughs> That's true. Uh, she went inside, and she stopped speaking, but my worst moment of my life to that point transitioned transformed in a matter of seconds, like 15 or 20 seconds, to the greatest moment of my life. Because I actually did what Helen Keller talked about. I started envisioning Jesus Christ on Palm Sunday, on a cult. They're saying, Hosanna, come conquering king is pretty much what that means. Come conquering king. Overthrow the Romans, set up your kingdom here, we're on your team, we want success, we love you, you're awesome. And within days, they've all abandoned him, and they, they got this crowd to say, give us Barabbas and, and kill Jesus, and they trump up charges, and then they falsely convict him, and all of his disciples run away from him, 
And then the soldiers put a mocking crown of thorns on his head. They say that they saved that over in Notre Dame. Who, who'll ever know that? And they beat his face. They mock him. They make fun of him. They scourge him with 39 lashes on his back. He's nearly dead as he walks up the hill carrying his cross till he drops and Simon of Cyrene carries it the rest of the way. And then they nail him, feet and hands, to the cross between, between two criminals. One of them is continuing to mock him. The other one says, stop mocking him. This man is doing nothing but love. He did nothing wrong, yet we've done wrong. And that guy humbles himself at the very last second on the cross. He couldn't kneel, could he? He was nailed to a cross, that other guy. But in his heart, he humbled himself. He said, you're God, will you please remember me? And Jesus says, truly you'll be with me in paradise. It is not our works, our righteousness, our goodness, our avoiding badness that makes us God's children. It is God's goodness, it is Jesus' love, it is the blitz he took for us, and it is simply the humility to accept it. And I think I'm talking probably to many people who love God, have been in church, have been serving God, awesome ministry here. And a few of us who, maybe we think we're Christians, we live in America, but oh my gosh, I really don't have that Jesus dude in me. I don't have the Holy Spirit. This is a great morning to go on that spiritual journey and, and, and literally get on your knees and say, God, take over my life. And I'm speaking to the person who's never done it and to those of us who have, because you were probably asking that question when I said zero to one, 100%, how much of my life have I given to God? You're thinking, it's really not 100%. I still have some pride, still have some arrogance. I like my savings account. I want to have those vacations. I want life to go this way. I need things to go the way I want with my family. When we can get to the point where we can say, I do not need life to go the way I want, and I'll let it go the way you want, God, then he can do amazing things with us. And that's what I want for all of us. God to do amazing things with us. Use us as ambassadors for reconciliation. Apologize and heal our marriages. Show our kids what real love is. Put sex back in the context of the fireplace where fire does well as opposed to in the kitchen, the living room. Our culture is one of a la carte sex on the buffet line of life. No commitments, just a sport, just a game. We're tolerant of everything, but we don't forgive anything when someone messes up in public. Then we're meaner than anyone to them. That's because we got the whole equation mixed up. God invented this stuff. Love, marriage, romance, sexuality, children, family, legacy. Let's get back into the book, the Word of God, and get back into Jesus, the one who shows us how to live it and gives us the power to live it. Put our marriages and our families and our businesses, our schools, our political activity, our compassionate outreach to others. Let's put that back in the place that God wants it to be. So as I'm on that porch thinking about Palm Sunday, transitioning to Good Friday, where all those terrible things happened to Jesus, and he did them for me, I started to cry. I couldn't avoid praying anymore. And I felt more of God's love than ever in my life before during the middle of my blitz, and I started to love him back spontaneously, and then I heard these words, forget what lies behind and press on to what lies ahead. And it was like, let go of football. I gave it to you. It's a cool little platform. Use it to glorify me. Kurt Warner spoke at this breakfast 2002 or so, 2003, won a Super Bowl. You know, I've got a platform because I played pro football. It's, you know, it's about 10 feet wide. Kurt won Super Bowls. His is about 1,000 feet wide and really high. Your platform is your experience, and there's people you will reach that I will never reach and Kurt Warner will never reach. Forget what lies behind. Accept Jesus Christ. Give your whole life to him and press on to what lies ahead, which is that you are a son or a daughter of God, beloved in him. Your identity is already earned and deserved by Christ. You don't have to work for it. You need to live from it. And now go live out your purpose, which is explained in Romans 8, 29, to conform to the image of Christ, start becoming more like him. And in 2 Corinthians, it says that you're an ambassador for Christ. It's a cool job description, isn't it? Representative for him. In your marriage, to your kids, to your grandkids, to the neighbors, to the kid who doesn't have a daddy or a mommy, to the drug addict or the person at the homeless shelter, to the person of a different background or pers political persuasion, and to the person who doesn't yet know that God loves them and it's not a religion that gets them there, it's a relationship. What a joy to talk about Jesus on Good Friday.
But why should it be on Good Friday and Easter and Christmas alone? But we do need to not do it so religiously. Let people that don't have this church background get into this conversation. Ask them questions. Don't expect them to have their act together. Don't expect them to change all their behavior before they accept Jesus. Jesus let prostitutes and lepers and tax swindlers and other folks come to him and believe in him and hang out with him and have dinner with him. And then he'd say, after changing them, he'd say, hey, you're free. You don't need to go and sin anymore. That's what we can help people do through modeling humility and letting Jesus take over our life. Can I say a closing prayer? And in this closing prayer, I want to give a person who's never really begun that relationship with Jesus Christ to begin it. And that would be by saying, God, I I know that I mess up and I, I sin. I can't solve this myself. I've been holding you at arm's length. Maybe I thought you were too judgmental or religious or pushy. I I didn't like the image I had of you, but forgive me. I want your forgiveness. I accept Jesus Christ. Come into my life. Change me. Make me who you want me to be. And definitely, please, take me to heaven when I die. Because this morning I'm realizing that I'm not just a body with a soul. As C.S. Lewis said, I'm a soul made in the image of God that lasts forever, and I don't want it to be away from God, either here in my short earthly life or for eternity where he's going to perfect everything and make it even better than we can imagine. That's not clouds and harps. It's way more cool than that, but I can't explain it to you, heaven. And I'm praying for those of us who do know Jesus, who are Christian by label, that we would give whatever we think 100% of our life is to God. Stop holding on. Confess something to our spouse. Let go of our money and start tithing, being more generous. Be a reconciler. Be a lover. Be a peacemaker. All right, let's pray. God, this uh, Good Friday, 2,000-something years after Jesus, intentionally, after praying to be released from the the burden and mission you gave him, still chose your will over his own, and he went to the cross, and he died on purpose, and he bore the sin of me and all of us, the whole world. And he he was buried, and he sent our punishment away. But by raising from the dead, being seen by 500 people, commissioning his disciples, which includes us, to go love others and to share the good news of Jesus, Father, this Good Friday, um, we thank you. We humble ourselves. And I want to pray a prayer, and and maybe a person who's deciding this is the moment to come to God, to come to Jesus, I would pray this with me. Father, forgive me for going my own way and misjudging you and not accepting you. I, I know that I'm a sinner. I can't live a perfect life. I can't get back to you on my own. I need Jesus, and I accept him as best I can. Come into my life. Change me and make me who you want me to be. Turn my blitzes around. And I want to go to heaven. And I thank you for that forgiveness and eternal life. Lord, and each of us pray that we would be more humble and more grateful, more focused every single morning and all through the day on the great eternal gift of your agape love and that we'd let our identity be based in who God says we are, not what we can do with our job or by impressing people. Or even in being a mom, as noble as that is, our identity is in Christ. Lord, help us be ambassadors for Christ who overcome blitzes with a long-term perspective and a willingness to change and be more humble and then a focus on blessing others and investing in them instead of consuming from them. God, we want to be your peacemakers and we want your kingdom to come, both here on earth and in heaven. Thank you for dying on the cross, raising from the dead, saving us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Jeff. It was an excellent talk. I think there are times when we can take away some things. Just a couple of things that I thought were very important. 
that I want you to remember as uh, we go through today that Jeff said, pride, the downfall of us all. Embrace your blitzes as opportunities, God's opportunities. Vision, the ability to see what's invisible to others. Our identity is based on who made us. Love people. Pray the best prayer, God fix me. Let go and let God, and he'll do amazing things to and through us. Excellent talk. Let's give one more round of applause. So I have a surprise announcement this morning. So the past 17 years, Bob Klaus, a.k.a. Billboard Bob, has coordinated what has become known as the Good Friday Prayer Breakfast. He started 17 years ago, and it's a great way for all faiths to come to start a, an Easter weekend celebration, celebration of the good news. It just enables us to gather, to have a time of fellowship, prayer, worship, and have some amazing speakers like we just did. A little history. Um, for three years after uh, Kurt Warner won the Super Bowl and was MVP, people tried to get him to come to Cedar Rapids to speak without success. So Bob started bugging Kurt's mom, Sue. Ends up going to St. Louis, drops by Kurt's office for this First Things First Foundation, makes his proposal, and Kurt becomes the second speaker at the Good Friday Prayer Breakfast. As uh, they say, the rest is history. Bob was wondering when he was going to retire from the Good Friday Prayer Breakfast, so he started to pray about that and felt God would make it clear in this past year. He knew it was time, so he prayerfully sought what would take place. And as he said, leave it to an amazing God to bring true men of God on board. Bart Woods is transitioning from his company, Primus Companies, to do something full-time in ministry and coordinating the Good Friday Prayer Breakfast fit nicely in his new effort to serve God. Bernie Hayes, recently retired from Rockwell Collins, will join Bart as they become the Bert and Ernie Show. I'm sorry, Bart and Bernie. <laughs> Bart and Bernie Show. Bob looks forward to what God has in store for the future of the Good Friday Prayer Breakfast, knowing that he's leaving in capable hands. So let's give Bob a round of applause to show our appreciation. message this morning, huh? I mean, God is good to have gotten uh, Jeff in here. It's kind of, uh, I don't know if the right word is ironic, but I started this with a uh, NFL quarterback and uh, 17 years ago, and uh, I guess I'm going to end it with a uh, NFL quarterback. And again, I just appreciate everyone here that you've supported this ministry for the you know past 17 years. Um, and um, I would just say that uh, Jeff's message this morning was so powerful, and I think that a lot of us would hope that some other people would have been here to share. Well, on the Good Friday Prayer Breakfast website, the previous prayer breakfasts are on there, uh, except a couple of them, and I'll, I'll get those on there. And this one will be on there as soon as we can get it on there. So just go to the goodfridayprayerbreakfast.org. It's on page two. You scroll down, and it's a YouTube thing, and you can either watch the whole thing or you can move it to when the message starts. So I would just encourage you to, to do that. We've been blessed with so many good speakers over the past 17 years and uh, God is just, you know, it's all God. It's just, uh, I have no clue what I'm doing. I still don't. So that's what good reason to turn it over to these guys because they'll do a great job and looking forward, I'm going to help them a little bit in the transition. So. Again, I didn't mean to go on too much, but I just love you guys and thank you so, so much. Truly, Lord God, your mercies are new to us this morning. 
and your faithfulness endures forever and ever. We thank you, Lord God, for placing Bob Claus here. Thank you, Lord God, that you gave him this opportunity to bring these men of God who have given us much. Lord God, I also thank you for Jeff Kemp as he was able to deliver your word, Lord God, with power this morning. We thank you for your grace and we thank you for the reminder that Jesus Christ is Lord and there is no other. And because of his death on the cross and his resurrection, we have life and not death. We thank you that because of him, we have been given this eternity in Christ. Thank you that he is the lover of our soul and the lifter of our head. We just bless your name, Lord God. And I also pray, Father, that Lord God, you would be with each one of us here. Thank you that we have experienced you in a powerful way. Father, we pray for our churches, we pray for our families, that you will, Lord God, make that blitz beautiful. And I pray, Father, for our, our marriages, that you will, Lord God, keep us humble. Give us the unity in the body of Christ, in humility. Lord God, I just pray for a restoration of our families, of our churches, of our, of our community, of our state, and Lord God, of our nation. Bring that life in us. And put fire in our bones. That we would, Lord God, love you with all our heart, with all our might, with all our strength, and with our very being. And now may the love of God and the fellowship that we have in his son Jesus Christ and the sweet anointing of the Holy Spirit be upon our lives now and forevermore. And all God's people said with a loud